In this video, we'll study some additional concepts that you'll need to make the semantics for your language. I'll focus on three concepts. The differences in lexicon between languages, the difference in words, the need for some words that are more polite and more impolite, and these are euphemisms and dysphemisms, and systems of formality across languages. So I know this sounds really dumb, but if you think about it, it has some pretty interesting consequences. Languages don't have the same words. If you look at communities of bees around the world, they're all going to be expressing the same concepts, but this is not true for humans. For example, in English, you have a word like to know. So I know linguistics and I know Joe. In Spanish, there are two different words for these concepts. You, uh, yo sé lingüística, I know a thing like linguistics, and yo conozco a Juan. I know Juan, a person. So knowing a thing and knowing a person are different in Spanish, whereas you, you'd use the same word in English. This, these two words are from Russian. English has the word to go, but there's no word to go in Russian. Rather, there are two different concepts, going on foot or some form of human propulsion and going on a vehicle like a car or a plane. So for example, um, Idiom from Moscow, I go to Moscow like on foot, or Yedu from Moscow, I go to Moscow on a plane or in a car. So there isn't an exact match between the concept to go and the concepts idiom and Yedu. This can also happen the other way around, where you have several concepts in English that are uh, conceptualized as being the same in other languages. For example, in English, we have the pronouns he, she, and singular they. Whereas Turkish would only use one word for all of those. The word o, as in o yash. Um, she eats, he eats, they eat. Um, Mandarin Chinese does the same. This is ta, which can mean any of these. As in ta chur, um, she eats, but also he, she, uh, he eats, they eat. So you can see that words don't need to correspond from language to language. Why would this happen? It happens mainly because human cultures are different, and so human cultures are going to have a need for one word or another, depending on how they organize themselves. A very clear example for this is kinship systems, or how we call our family members. In English, we have words like sister and brother, but in Japanese, you distinguish between your older siblings and your younger siblings. So, one-san and oni-san are the older ones, and imoto and dototo are the younger ones. There can be systems that are more complex. So for example, there are many languages in the US that use a kinship system called the Iroquois kinship system. It's used in Anishinaabe communities, for example, Ojibwe, and it is also used in the Bribri language. So these are different words for siblings. For example, an ake is the brother of a woman. A kuta is the sister of a man. And an ir is the brother of a man and the sister of a woman. So these two people that we call uh, with different words in English have the same word in Bribri. And you can see that I'm severely simplifying the explanation. The system is actually a lot more complicated. But the main idea is that if your society conceptualizes families in one way or another, you're going to need words for those concepts. Space also has some influence in the words that you're going to need. For example, imagine you live on a small island. Uh, it wouldn't make a lot of sense to talk about east and west because east will very rapidly become west. So maybe it makes sense to have words that mean something like sea words and land words towards the center. This is what happens in Cook Islands, Maori. So there are directional words like kitai, which means going in the sea direction, and kiuta, which is going towards the center of the island. So the location where you are can also have an influence on the words that you will need, and so you will invent those words. We have the very interesting case of colors. Colors are a continuum, a physical continuum, that we then split into arbitrary splits. For example, we have all these wonderful colors, but English splits them into something we call red, or something we call blue. And you can see that all these colors here are really different 
However, we conceptualize all of these as, di as different shades of blue. Languages may make arbitrary cuts in different ways. For example, in Japanese, all of these colors would be subsumed into a single color called aoi, or ao, which is blue-green, or green-blue. Uh, it's actually called gru in psycholinguistics because it's a combination of green and blue. Many languages have gru, Japanese, Thai, Vietnamese. As you can see here, th these are examples from Japanese, and ao mushi is a green caterpillar, but you can also have ao zora, a blue sky. So ao is a color that encompasses both shades of green and shades of blue. So you can, you can make the cut to include these two into one. Or you can just keep cutting and have new colors. In English, we have green and blue. But Russian splits blue into two different and distinct colors. Sini, which is the darker one, and Galuboy, which is the lighter one. So, for example, you have uh, Galoboy Nieba, a blue sky, and this little bird here, which is for us a darker shade of blue, is a Sinia Ptitsa, a blue bird, but with this darker shade of blue. And again, these are as distinct for Russian speakers as green and blue are distinct for us. Again, you can these cuts can be made in many ways. There are languages that have only three colors: the color dark the color light, and the color red. So, for example, the color dark would include shades like very dark shades of blue and red. The color light will include whites and greens and yellows. And the color red would include shades of orange, red, but also pink and lilac, as you can see. So if you're an artist and you need to paint in this language, how are you going to distinguish between words? The same way you distinguish them in English or any other language when you need more color words. You're going to borrow them from the natural world. For example, these are colors in English, orange and violet, that really come from words in the natural world. We do this in English all the time. We have papaya pink and moss green and strawberry red. So in a language with only three color words, you would have strawberry red, but blueberry red. And these would be different shades of the same color, but the artist could clearly distinguish between the two. All right. Languages can have different words because of their societies, because of their environment, or just because of sheer luck, as with splitting the colors. One and one, Another aspect in which society can influence your language is by what things it considers to be taboo. And so it's going to invent a lot of words to try to circumvent those taboos. For example, what do you call this object? probably call it something like a toilet. However, if you were with your grandmother, you wouldn't necessarily call it that. Maybe you would call it a bathroom, maybe a water closet. All of these are euphemisms, which are words that are softer or more polite than the real object. We have euphemisms, but we also have the opposite. We have dysphemisms, which are words that are more vulgar, stronger, or more taboo than the actual object. So do you know any vulgar words to refer to this object? You probably do. The important thing about dysphemisms is why would we have them? We have them so that we can use them with people we trust, with our friends, for example. In situations where we can use these vulgar words to let them know that they can trust us and like we can trust them. So you use dysphemisms with people like your friends to show social bonds, and um, you use euphemisms with people you need to be respectful with, like your grandmother but they both have distinct usages. It's not about just being vulgar. We have a ton of taboos in our society, for example, about bodily functions, hygiene, and sex. And languages use taboos, not just for euphemisms and dysphemisms, but to invent insults and swear words. You know a lot in English. And other languages can also use religious taboos. For example, English had a lot of these 500 years ago. It almost has none at this point. Maybe just, God damn it. And as you can see from this quote from Shakespeare, people can get really creative with using, um, for example, humors in insults. Like, why dost thou converse with that trunk of humors, that stuffed cloak bag of guts? Finally, let's talk about formality. 
In many languages, you need to distinguish between formal situations and informal situations, and the language is going to change accordingly. For example, in French, these two sentences mean the same. Tu manches, vous manches. This one is for informal situations, like to use with your friends. And vous manches is for formal situations, like, you, like with your boss. This is called a TV distinction because it's with the pronouns tu and vous in French. Spanish has the same distinction. We uh, in Costa Rica use vos comes and usted come. Vos is with friends and usted would be with your boss, with a professor, someone you're just meeting and so forth. Obviously, sign languages can also have these. This is an example from the sign language of the Netherlands where we have, would you like some coffee? Formal you. So this is the formal pronoun and the informal one would be the pointed hand. There's many ways in which formality can be expressed in languages. Japanese has a very complex formality system, of which this is just a very short example. Um, you can have verbs like mita, I saw, as in eiga o mita, I saw the movie. And this would be if you were talking with your friends. You can have eiga o mimashita, if you're talking in a more formal situation or with someone you don't know very well. I saw the movie, eiga o mimashita. You can also have this one, eiga o haiken shimashita. If you're talking about something you did to someone you have to be respectful with. So this is like the humble form, like I humbly watched a movie, boss. Um, we also have gorangi narimashita, which is about someone, about something someone else did, like your boss. Oh, eiga o gorangi narimashita. You saw the movie, boss. So you can see how these are used depending on whether you're talking about yourself or someone you consider in-group and someone else that you consider out-group. So gorang inarimashita would be if the boss saw the movie, haiken shimashita would be if you or your friends saw the movie. And this is just a summary of how it works. So you can see that it's a very intricate system. In summary, languages don't have the same words because their cultures need different concepts, and so new words are invented for those concepts. The environment can also uh, play an influence because you're going to need words to describe this environment. Some of these concepts can be taboo, so you need euphemisms and dysphemisms to get around them. And the society might uh, demand divisions in formality when you treat people, so you might also get words and structures to reflect that.